Well, guys, today we have a special treat. We have a guest with us today who is a precious man of God, has almost, almost 40 years of ministry experience on that front. He did start when he was five years old, okay? <laughs> now I'm kidding on that end. But Tony Cook is a renowned teacher, author. He is a gift to the body of Christ. He has a mission from God to strengthen churches and leaders. And God has used him here in the United States and around the world. And we are so privileged today to be friends with Tony. Tony's an overseer for me and for this church, and he is a great man of God. I want you to all stand to your feet and greet him as he comes to share what God has for him today. Thank you, Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. You can go ahead and be seated. Uh, Pastor Ken, thank you. Don't you love and appreciate Pastor Ken and Kathy? I don't, I don't say this as empty flattery or anything of that nature, but you guys just have wonderful, wonderful pastors here. And uh, we love and appreciate you guys. I want to say thank you to you as a congregation for, for one thing, giving to your church. When you give to your church, of course, your church is a great steward of the resources and you're making a difference in the world. But one of the things that happens when you give to your church is that your church then will give and support other groups. And we are one of the uh, ministries that uh, we've been privileged to receive from your generosity over the years. And um, I, I've been in full-time traveling for 16 years, uh, 16 and a half. And um, we've been to 31 nations preaching, uh, 47 states. And, um, and you helped us on many of our trips. And I just want to say thank you for giving to your church <clears throat> because that way your church is able to help and uh, support others as well. I wanted to show you just a couple pictures real quickly of some of the things that we've been able to do this year. Uh, this year, <coughs> excuse me, I've been to um, Turkey, to Egypt, to Cyprus, to Lebanon, uh, London three times, uh, France twice, uh, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, um, and I know Italy, um, Colombia. <coughs> and um, you've helped us in, in doing these things. This picture right here is from a group that participated in a Holy Spirit conference in Turkey in uh, uh, August of this year. About 105 people came from all over the nation of Turkey. As you know, Turkey is about 99.8% Muslim, uh, but there's some precious, precious believers there. And I was privileged to spend four days with them. We held this conference uh, right outside of the ruins of ancient Ephesus. Uh, so that was really cool to be able to, you know, where Paul spent time ministering and uh, the letter to the Ephesians was written and placed, you know, things of that nature, to be able to meet with modern day believers there in the nation of Turkey. From Turkey, we popped down to Cairo, Egypt, and we have a picture here of our time there. That is Amgad. Uh, he is the gentleman that helped oversee the translation of four of our books into Arabic. Uh, those books are now circulating across northern Africa, the Middle East. I just got a picture of a Kurdish pastor uh, in northern Iraq holding one of the books. And um, so we were able to spend several days in Egypt, both Cairo and Alexandria. And that same night, the next picture is of uh, some of the pastors that took part and we did a book signing. We had 60 pastors come together, uh, Egyptian pastors, and uh, signed book. All of them got free books. Um, uh, we met, it was very cool, we met on a boat in the Nile River. That's where we did this book signing and teaching time that night for the pastor. So we had a wonderful time. I wanted to show you a picture. Our books are in several languages right now. Uh, the stack on the left are about 75% of our foreign translations. We have books now in Arabic, in Russian, in Greek, in Indonesian, in German, French, Spanish, and Portuguese. Uh, by December 1st, uh, we're supposed to have our first book out in Mandarin Chinese. They're telling me it'll be printed by then. And so we're very pumped about that. The stack on the right are the English books. And here's the, the English books in, in more detail. 
Um, a couple books I want to mention to you uh, that may be of interest. The, the book on the lower left-hand corner is our, is our very first book called Life After Death, Rediscovering Life After the Loss of a Loved One. And that book, um, you might want to be mindful. You know, we're in, just started the holiday season and things like that. If you know people who've lost a loved one in recent times, that may be something you would want to get and put in their hands. It's a book that just brings uh, peace and comfort and encouragement to people who've had a loved one pass on. So we wanted to mention that to you. And then the book on the lower right-hand corner uh, is a book called Lift. It's the, the red one, Lift, Experiencing the Elevated Life. And it's about resurrection life. And not just about the resurrection of Jesus, but about the resurrection life that we are called to live based on his resurrection. And that's what we're going to be ministering on today. But before we jump into the message, let's go ahead and pray. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for Vertical Church. Thank you for every person that's gathered here today. Father, we thank you for the privilege and honor that you've called us into relationship with yourself. Lord, you've called us into sonship, being the sons and the daughters of God. Uh, you've given us the privilege of being born again, of having a brand new beginning, a fresh start in life, being a new creature in Christ. And Father, we thank you for the empowerment of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we're inviting the Holy Spirit to be to us what he wants to be, our strengthener, our comforter, our teacher. Lord, as we look at your written word today, Lord, we thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit uh, speaking to each and every heart, our, our minds. Lord, we thank you for bringing change and healing and transformation into our lives. We thank you for making us everything that you want us to be and empowering us to do everything that you desire us to do. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Well, we're going to talk about resurrection today. And you may think that um, I've been in too many time zones and not realizing that this is Thanksgiving, Christmas time, not Easter time. But um, I, I, I believe this with all of my heart, that Jesus was not raised from the dead so that we could have an annual holiday. He was raised from the dead so that we could have life and power every day. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not against having a special day where we celebrate the resurrection or a special day where we celebrate Christmas. I kind of like all the festivities and all the fun and, you know, things. And I think it's fine and wonderful to remember things on a certain day. But, you know, God's called us to a holy life. Uh, God's with us every day. And the resurrection is one of those things that if we only think of Jesus being raised from the dead one day out of the year, then we're missing a certain benefit blessing 364 other days of the year. Because Jesus wasn't raised so we could have an annual holiday, he was raised from the dead so that we could have life and power every day. Jesus is alive. And Jesus said, because I live, you will live also. And so we want to look today at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Several years ago, I was in a certain nation preaching, and this is a nation that had a, a pretty equal representation of a lot of different religious groups. And I taught at a Bible school in the morning. In the afternoon, they, that my host said, would you like to look around the city? And, um, and we just happened to, you know, be by a, a Muslim a, a mosque and um, a Hindu temple and a Buddhist temple. And, uh, and we took time to kind of walk around and even go inside, look at some of the architecture and things like that. And one of these, um, I believe it was the Hindu temple, if I'm not mistaken, it was a certain religious day for them. And um, they had uh, a couple of their, I, I don't know if they're their holy men or what, and uh, but, but it was a special day and, and they were kind of stripped down to the waist and they had a cart, um, you know, like a little wagon with wheels on it. And, um, and there was a, a, a figure, I, I'm assuming it was one of their deities, 
um, you know, a, a shrine, an idol type of thing. And they had a rope attached to the wagon. And then attached to the rope was a really sharp hook, like a huge, huge fish hook. And, and they had taken the fish hook and, um, and they had pierced it through the skin on this guy's back, you know, that was stripped down to the waist. And he was pulling through the streets with this, you know, the rope was tight. It looked like the, the God thing on the wagon was pretty heavy. And so he's straining, you know, to pull this with the fish hook, the big hook through the skin in his back. And you could see it was pulling the skin pretty hard. And um, I was just, I, I just kind of looked at it and, and I said, you know, Jesus, thank you that you were pierced for me. And I said, God, thank you that I don't have to carry you around on a wagon. You carry me in your arms. And I, I don't say that to be negative or, you know, critical of anyone else, but it just made me thankful that Jesus is alive, that Jesus is raised from the dead. Um, you know, we can talk to people of different backgrounds and, and people can make, you know, kind of statements of seeming equivalency and they can say, well, you know, your founder has a lot of followers. Well, our founder has a lot of followers. And yeah, that's true. And, and they might say to us, um, and, and your founder gave you a holy book, but our founder gave us a holy book. And we'd say, yeah, that's true too. And they might say, well, you know, the followers of your founder meet in buildings to worship. Well, the followers of our founder, we meet in buildings to worship. And we'd have to say to all those things, yep, that's all right, you know, that's all correct. But at some point we can lovingly and respectfully say, but our founder was raised from the dead. Jesus is alive. And, and that is, if, if we don't understand that, then we reduce Christianity to just another belief system, another philosophy, and that type of thing. But the thing that makes Christianity unique among every belief system in the world is that our founder has been raised from the dead. Jesus is alive. And, and that's not just a historical fact, but that becomes an, an experiential reality to us that Jesus isn't just alive in history. Jesus isn't just alive in eternity, but he is alive on the inside of us. I want you to look in your Bibles at Luke chapter 24, and I want to look at the historical fact of Jesus' resurrection. Uh, this is the evening after Jesus had been raised from the dead. The disciples were together. They were talking, and it says, and just as they were telling about it, Jesus himself was suddenly standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. But the whole group was startled and frightened, thinking they were seeing a ghost. Why are you frightened, he asked. Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. You can, you can see that it's really me. Touch me and make sure that I am not a ghost because ghosts don't have bodies as you see that I do. And he spoke, as he spoke, he showed them his hands and his feet Still, they stood there in disbelief, filled with joy and wonder. Then he asked them, look at the question Jesus asks, do you have anything here to eat? Why did Jesus ask that? He knew that Christians never get together without food. It's just, it's just not something we do. I mean, if we have a, a conference on fasting, we're still going to have food there. Um, he said, do you have anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. And notice what Jesus did. And he ate it as they watched. Jesus wanted to remove any doubt 
Jesus wanted to preclude any question or any speculation because I think Jesus knew that someday somebody who thought they were really smart was going to say, well, we don't really believe that Jesus was really literally raised from the dead. We just believe it was a, a metaphorical, metaphysical projection of their hopes and whatever, you know, a bunch of uh, whatever. And um, Jesus wanted his disciples to know, this is me. This is my body. This, these are my hands, my feet. And he took the fish and he ate it in their presence so that they would forever remember that Jesus literally, physically was raised from the dead. When we talk about our faith, we're not just talking about some philosophical idea. We're talking about believing in the reality of something that tangibly, physically, historically happened. Jesus is alive. That's what our faith is based on. And we celebrate that every year in the springtime. We call it Easter, Resurrection Sunday. We celebrate that. But I want you to know that, that the resurrection of Jesus really is just one of two major resurrections that the Bible teaches. The other resurrection, the first is that of Jesus in our past. But there's another resurrection that the Bible teaches that is yet in our future. How many of you know there's a resurrection yet to come? And that involves us. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20, uh, the Bible says that our citizenship is in heaven. Aren't you thankful for that? That we're headed to heaven. We belong there. We are born of God. Our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that believers are eagerly waiting for Jesus Christ to come back. We believe that the one who came the first time is coming again. And I remember times in my life where I wasn't so eager about Jesus coming. Uh, when I was 15 years of age, I got a hold of a book. Some of you that are my age may remember this book. It was called The Late Great Planet Earth. And it was written by a gentleman. He was talking about how Jesus is going to come back and we're going to be raptured. We're going to be caught away. And as a 15-year-old, I remember thinking, but Lord, I don't have my driver's license yet. <laughs> Jesus, I really hope you don't come back because I want to drive. I want to, I want to be able to get in a car and drive around town. That to me was just kind of like the pinnacle of cool and the ultimate in, you know, if I can drive, I will have arrived in life. And then when I was about 19 years old, and of course, you know, I'm hearing different things about Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. And I'm 19 years old and I'm engaged and I'm thinking, Jesus, please don't come back until I've had time to get married. I want to be married for a while, Jesus, before you come back. So I have to admit, there were a few times in life when I was not eagerly waiting for Jesus to come back. I was hoping he would not come back until I got to experience some things in life. And, um, but I'm going to tell you what, if Jesus had come back, the day before I got my driver's license, it would have been all right. Because heaven is, is going to immediately make every earthly experience seem so mundane and unimportant. Um, but the Bible says we are eagerly waiting for the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice what it says in verse 21, that he will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, uh, even uh, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Jesus is coming back. And when he comes back, there's going to be another big resurrection. We're going to get new bodies. You know, every once in a while, you know, I was talking to Brother Bill from the book table. I was talking to him on the way to church this morning, and we were talking about how the, the Bible says the outward man 
is perishing. How many of you felt on Thursday night that your outward man was perishing? maybe from eating too much on Thursday, but the Bible says the outward man is perishing, but the inward man is renewed day by day. But the Bible says there is coming a time when when this body, this mortal, what Paul calls our lowly body is going to be transformed and it's gonna be conformed to one like his glorious body. You're gonna get body 2.0. So the next time you look in the mirror in the morning and you're tempted to feel really discouraged, just look at yourself and say, new body's coming. We're going to get glorified bodies. But here's our point today. We are living not in the future when we get new bodies. And nor are we living 2,000 years ago when Jesus got raised from the dead but we are living between two great resurrection events, the resurrection of Jesus and our eventual physical resurrection. We're living in between two events. My question today, what I want us to look at very quickly is do we get any resurrection benefits in the here and the now? I believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead, not for us to live a religious life, but for us to live a resurrection life. I believe there is power flowing from his resurrection that carries us to the future resurrection and and that we get to enjoy some resurrection life, some resurrection benefits in the here and the now. Not to the full degree when we get our new glorified bodies, but I believe we're called to live a resurrection lifestyle. See, Jesus said something very important when his friend Lazarus died. You may remember the story from John chapter 11 where uh, Lazarus died and Mary and Martha, you know, the sisters, they were upset. Their brother had died and, and they said, Jesus, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. And one of the things that Jesus said to them was this. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. I want you to stop and think about that. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. You see, if we're not careful, it's very easy to think of the resurrection as an event or events, plural, because they are. There is an event that we read about where Jesus was raised from the dead. That's an event. There's an event when Jesus returns and we get new glorified bodies. That's an event. But resurrection is not just an event. Resurrection is a person. It is the person of Jesus Christ. And when our life is connected to him, when our faith is in him, when our trust is in him, the Bible says greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The Bible says Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so if Jesus himself, and he literally said this, I am the resurrection and the life, then I can say this to you today, the resurrected one is in me. Not only is the resurrected one in me, because Christ is in me, but the Holy Spirit is the one who raised Jesus from the dead, and the Holy Spirit is dwelling in my life as well. So both the resurrected one and the resurrecting one are in my life. I want you to look at what the Bible says in Romans chapter 6, verse 4. Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. It says, for we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. Let me ask you the question. How many of you in here today, you've been baptized in water? Let me see your hand. You've been baptized. How many of you got baptized here at this church? Let me see your hands. Wow, a whole bunch of you. 
Pastor Ken, where do you guys do your baptisms? In the gathering place out there. And um, so do you, do you guys like... So how many of you guys got baptized here? Again, let me see your hand. You guys have baptized a lot of folks, Pastor Ken. Did you notice that... Do, do you do it or do you have somebody else do it? A team of people that do it. Did you notice that when you got baptized, those of you that were baptized here, that whoever was, was helping you in that baptism that they, you're standing there just kind of minding your own business and the next thing you know, they're throwing you underneath. <laughs> Did you notice that happened? See, I was a lifeguard for three summers. We used to tell people to stop that. We just called it dunking, you know, when people would go up and throw people under the water. But see, at church, you volunteer to have that done to you. We call it baptism here. Did you notice that, that somebody just came up to you and they may have said something like, you know, now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we baptize you. And they took you and what they do? They took your body under the water. What, what, what's this about? That represents burial, going under the water and being submerged underneath the water. That represents baptism. That represents death. It represents burial. What you're saying is that just like Jesus died and was buried, you died with him and you were buried with him. But did you notice, and I know this happened because you're here today, they didn't leave you under there. <laughs> you don't want the person doing baptism to you to forget, how does the rest of this go? I can't. So I'm trying to remember. I know there's another part to this. Oh, yeah. And we got to bring them back up. You, you never want to get half baptized. It's really bad for your health. But the other part of baptism is you're taken under the water. You're saying, I died with Christ. But then you're brought up out of the water because that is your public declaration that just like Jesus was raised from the dead, you're saying, I have been raised from the dead. Baptism is where you declare that you identify with Christ. You're saying, I identify as someone who has been resurrected with Christ. That's your declaration of your identity. I identify as a resurrected one. Romans 6, 4 says, For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also... Say those three words with me. Now we also... See, it isn't just Jesus that gets to live a new life, having been resurrected. Say those three words with me again. Now we also may live new lives. Jesus wasn't raised from the dead so we could lead a religious life. Jesus was raised from the dead so that we could live a resurrection life, a new life. And see, that new life doesn't start when we get to heaven. That new life starts when we are born again. The minute that you are born again, you have the potential to begin living a resurrection life. No, you're not going to get your new body until Jesus returns, but we get to begin to live a resurrection, I'll just use this term, a resurrection lifestyle we begin to see ourselves as a new person. Uh, our attitudes can begin to have resurrection components. Our outlook on life. We can have hope where other people have no hope. We can have confidence. We can have peace. We can have joy when other people don't understand it because the resurrected one, we've been raised with Christ We've been raised to sit with him in heavenly places. We get to live a resurrection lifestyle. Now, Paul, in, in the Amplified Bible, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 11, 
I want to show you what Paul said here. Philippians 3.11 in the Amplified. Paul says that if possible, I may attain to the spiritual and moral resurrection that lifts me out from among the dead even while in the body. See, if you're waiting until Jesus returns to have any resurrection experience, you're missing out on some resurrection life that we can have even now. Paul refers to a spiritual and moral resurrection that lifts me out from among the dead even while I'm still in my body. Now, that doesn't change the fact that we're going to get a new body in the future ultimate resurrection. But like some people, have you ever heard people say, I want a little bit of heaven to go to heaven in? Have you ever heard people say that? Well, we know this isn't heaven yet, but I, I want a little of heaven's joy, a little bit of heaven's peace while I'm waiting to get to heaven. And what I'm saying is the same thing. I want a little bit of resurrection while I'm waiting for the resurrection. How did Paul describe it? That if possible, I may attain to the spiritual and moral resurrection that lifts me out from among the dead even while I'm in the body. In other words, we're not called to live the same old life that we used to live before Jesus became a part of our lives. When we connect with Jesus, there's something of his resurrection life that gives us new life to walk in even now while we're waiting for the ultimate resurrection. If we go to the very next verse in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, this is in the New Living Translation. Paul says, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection. How many of us can relate to that? How many of us know I've got some room to grow? Paul says, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already uh, uh, reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. So this perfection or this maturity, which I believe is the spiritual and moral resurrection that lifts us out from among the dead, even while we're in our body. How do we get there? What is, what is the key to, to living a resurrection lifestyle? Look at the next verse, Philippians 3, 13. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus. Everybody say focus. See, this is going to be really important for us. I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I want to propose to you today that the key to living a resurrection lifestyle is to be able to focus on forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. How many Christians are not living in the, in the full privileges and the full benefits of a resurrection lifestyle, a resurrection attitude, a resurrection mindset, a resurrection outlook, a resurrection optimism and hope because they're stuck in the past? Man, if anybody could have been stuck in the past, do you know it was Paul? Paul had... He'd taken part in the murder of a preacher. He'd taken part in the murder of a Christian. He had thrown other Christians in jail. He was pursuing Christians to throw them. And he, he thought he was doing the right thing, but he was full of rage and full of hatred and, and things. And, and then, thank God, he met Jesus. And you know what? When you encounter Jesus, when you surrender your life to Jesus... He washes away all sin. He gives you a brand new beginning. He gives you a brand new life. That's why in baptism you're brought up out of the water to show you were dead because of your sins. But now you've been raised up 
you've been cleansed, you've been washed, you get to live a brand new life. And Paul said, I have to forget what's behind. How many people ruin a potentially perfect good today because they keep dragging in all the stuff from yesterday? Now, when Paul said, I'm forgetting what's behind, can I tell you something? Forgetting is not amnesia. When Paul said he was forgetting what was behind, it doesn't mean he had no mental recollection of any of the events. Biblically, this is what forgetting is. It means that you're no longer under the power of the past. Doesn't mean you have amnesia and can't remember intellectually or informationally any of the data. Forgetting biblically means that you are free from the condemnation, the pain, the torment, the guilt, the shame, the regret. It means that you, you know that happened, but you know that you're a new person. You know that you are forgiven. You know that you have been made righteous by God and that he's given you a brand new start and you don't have to, you don't have to drag the ball and the chain of yesterday's disappointments, failures, whether it's stuff you did or stuff that was done to you. God is a resurrection God. He wants, us to, he wants to bring us out of the death of yesterday and give us the hope of a brand new day today and a, and a good future tomorrow. Let me share this with you in closing. God's always been a resurrection God. Before Jesus was raised from the dead, it's always been God's nature to give new life, to give new hope, etc. And um, Joseph in the Old Testament is one of the best examples of somebody that experienced resurrection life. Joseph had favor from his father. His father loved him. As a matter of fact, his father showed so much favor to Joseph that the rest of Joseph's brothers hated him, envied him, despised him. And, and it wasn't just attitude. They took action. Do you know what they did to their brother Joseph? They sold him into slavery. You know, we hear a lot about human trafficking today and the evils of human trafficking. And listen, as long as there's been sin in the hearts of men, people have been abused, misused, violated. Joseph in the Bible was a victim of human trafficking. His brothers sold him into slavery. He ended up in Egypt as a slave in Potiphar's house, a, a military official under Pharaoh. And for, you know, I can't even imagine emotionally and relationally how devastating that must have been. But there was something about Joseph. There was a resilience in him that no matter how much people hated him, he knew that he was a servant of God. And so he just, he just had this attitude you know, if they're going to make me a slave, I'm going to be the best slave Egypt ever saw. And so he served Pharaoh with excellence and Pharaoh gave him favor and gave him promotions and, and so on. And Joseph had success. But how many of you know, even though God blesses you, Satan never, he, Satan doesn't quit easy. And Potiphar's wife lies about him falsely accuses him. So now he ends up in jail. He's not just a slave anymore. Now he's a slave in prison. But again, there was something about Joseph. He just said, if I'm going to be a slave in prison, I'm going to be the best slave prisoner there ever was. And he starts, he says to the warden of the prison, well, what can I do to help? There's some people down here that I can help and assist. And he started serving. And, and the next thing you know, the warden says, hey, man, you are faithful. I, would, you, would you just run this place for me? I'm, here, here's the badge. You're now the assistant warden of the prison. See, there's something about when God's hand is on you for good, 
You, you cannot keep a good man down. You can knock him down. You can kick him. You can beat him. But God is going to raise him up one way or another. And the next thing you know, the next thing you know, Joseph is running the prison. And then two of Pharaoh's assistants get put in prison and they have dreams and Joseph interprets their dreams and, and it happens just like Joseph said. One was executed, one was restored. And when the one that got restored was going out of prison back to serve Pharaoh, Joseph says, hey, by the way, put in a good word for me. And the guy says, you bet. Gets up there, forgets about Joseph. Two years go by. Can I tell you, if anybody ever had a right to be bitter, to just say, you, hey, people are, you can't trust people, they're bad, bitter, resentful, it would have been Joseph. Two years later, Pharaoh has a dream. And the guy that Joseph had interpreted his dream, the guy, hey, <clears throat> there's a guy down in prison who interprets dreams. God gave him the ability to interpret dreams, and Pharaoh says, call him up here. Pharaoh sh or Joseph shows up before Pharaoh, and Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dream, and Pharaoh says, there's nobody with this much wisdom in my whole empire. He said, Joseph, how does the title prime minister sound to you? <laughs> How does the term vice president sound to you? And Joseph says, I can handle that. <laughs> Pharaoh now, I'm, I'm sorry, Joseph, ex with the exception of Pharaoh, only Pharaoh has more authority. Pharaoh, uh, Joseph is running and managing the greatest empire of the world. He's gone from the pit to the prison, to the palace. Now, that's a great story. You know, that's really a story of resurrection. You remember what Paul said was necessary for resurrection? I have to forget what's behind. Let me share this verse with you in closing. Genesis chapter 41. Years later, Joseph got married, had a couple kids. And it says in Genesis 41, 51, Joseph named his older son Manasseh. The word Manasseh means to forget. For he said, God has made me to forget all my troubles and everyone in my father's family. You know, what Joseph said, God's made me forget, doesn't mean he had amnesia. Doesn't mean he had no recollection of what happened. It meant that he was out from under the power of that. He was no longer oppressed by it. He was no longer in bondage. It no longer defined him. God has made me to forget all my troubles and everyone in my father's family. Joseph named his second son Ephraim. The word Ephraim means to be fruitful. For he said, God has made me fruitful in this land of my grief. Joseph was a man who experienced resurrection power from God. See, resurrection isn't just the two big events, Jesus being raised from the dead and us ultimately getting our new glorified bodies. Everywhere in between, before and after, God is always a resurrection God. God is always turning hopeless situations around. God is always bringing people out of despair. God is always raising people up out of the ashes to give people new hope. What God asks of us is that we have to be willing to forget the past. Let go of it. And we have to reach forward to what's ahead. God's a resurrection God. God has resurrection hope, possibilities for every single one of us in our lives. And he just wants us to tap into him as the source of resurrection. Why? Because Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Father in Jesus.